would love to hear what what did you hear from people? What was their water? What did you hear? The Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Ocean? Yep. What else? Stories of being naturally drawn to water, yeah. What else? Students. Students. We're studying every biology and one thing or another. Yeah, we have a handful. How many of you are in the room are students? We have a handful of students in the room. Yeah. Yeah, cool. What else? Growing up with it, like it's like part of your family. Early. Part of your family. Growing up with it. Yeah. Backyard, yeah. Lots of people yourself. close, yeah, close to water. That is kind of what this week is all about, is really understanding that connection at a deep, deeper level. And we're going to look at it really across the seven ages of water, from birth through death, which is what all of us experience in our human experience at some point. And those kind of stages are going to apply to a framework that we're going to use called Me, We, Do. Pretty simple. But how does it impact you as an individual? How does it impact your friends, your family, your community? And finally, what do you do about it? So once you have this new knowledge, once you've had this experience, what can you actually go and do differently because of it? And so I'm just going to ask Jay really quickly to chat to us really quickly on the seven ages. Why the seven ages and why Blue Mind experienced Monterey Bay? So I'll start with the second part of that. Um, we've been working on this Blue Mind idea for nearly a decade, going back to the original proposal, which, by the way, was submitted to a uh, few foundation and was denied ten, almost a decade ago, and uh, which, instead of stopping us, emboldened us to move forward and, and maybe approach this in a, a little bit different way that went outside of the traditional funding. Uh, so fast forward to now, we recognize that we've done these summits. Obviously, there's a book. There's lots of articles, lots of conversations going on, but we realize that one of the missing pieces was this sort of longer, slower format where we get to spend three and a half days uh, just thinking about this stuff and figuring out how it affects our lives and our careers and just spending more time together. Our summits are usually one really intense day, and really full and really awesome, but we decided let's accordion that out a little bit and spread it out. The Seven Ages of Water was the, was the theme for last year's Blue Mind Summit, which we held in Wisconsin. There's a strong, as you might imagine, strong focus on freshwater, lakes, and rivers. And the seven ages of water refers to um, your life from birth through death. And so the agenda and the format, really the backbone of this workshop, will be going through a human life cycle from birth through death and looking at how water uh, affects us, not just physically, not just in terms of hy hygiene and hydration, but emotionally and cognitively and, and uh, psychologically and socially. And even, here's a word that most scientists don't say in public, spiritually, right? Uh, there are a lot of people who go through life feeling life in a very spiritual way, whatever that, that means for them. We tend to shy away from that conversation, but in this workshop, we're, we're gonna dive into it and, and explore it. So the seven ages of water basically begins with birth. We go to play when we're little uh, hopefully you play for your whole life. And then the three big middle ages are the lover, the fighter, and the justice. And we'll explore all three of those and they'll make more sense. Later in life, you get into ebb and flow, which is when gravity starts to feel heavy and water becomes maybe therapeutic for us. And then the last and least favorite age is death. And um, for our purposes, tomorrow we're going to combine birth and death so that we don't end with death uh, for maybe obvious reasons. One of them is Diane, who will be joining us to, to speak to that topic, uh, really doesn't like to be the closer uh, at a conference, once again, talking about death. And so um, she's about as buoyant as a human as you will meet who will lead you through a conversation about death. Um, so that's the backbone, the seven ages of water. And it's meant to be uh, a way that we retell the story about our wild waters and oceans. Because the current story that we've been using, and we're, we're going to get into this shortly here with Jason, uh, the current story that we use is broken. It's insufficient. It does not encompass really any of this conversation in, our, in the serious conversations. I went to the 24th grade, I tell my kids, which freaks 
them out, really, because they're in 7th and 9th, and 7th uh, and 10th. And I never learned during those 24 years of my education any of this. Nobody ever said, the ocean makes you happy. I figured it out, obviously, as we all have. Or the ocean boosts your creativity. Or the ocean helps you relax. Or the ocean connects you to other people. Or the ocean's a great place to boost romance. Or the ocean's a great place to go and mourn and grieve when you're having a really, really tough time. Nobody ever said any of that. And we've got reams of research that shows that that's all true. And we've got thousands of years of history, art, prose, rhetoric that underline it as well. And so we're going to take these few days and march slowly through the seven ages of water. Um, that is also the backbone of my next book. So uh, if, if you say something super duper smart, uh, you may be quoted. Or actually, if you say something really um, funny, you may be quoted. Uh, very insightful. Um, so there's, there's that as well. The, the next book, Live Blue, the subtitle is The Seven Ages of Water. And, um, and then the last thing I'll say about that is this, there is a, a famous passage uh, in As You Like It by William Shakespeare uh, called The Seven Ages of Man. And it begins, all the world's a stage. And then it walks through, maybe familiar, one of the most repeated and recited of Shakespeare's uh, writings. So the seven ages of water is actually borrowed uh, from Shakespeare, and I want to give credit where credit is due. So I'm, I'm not, uh, not uh, accused of, of poaching from the bard. So, okay. So I do you want to go around? Yes. Yeah. So there's a, a number of people kind of from Blue Mind in the room that are here to help and facilitate, and so we thought since you've now gotten to know each other a little bit better, Jay could introduce those people well, that are in the our, room. With our us. team, and they they will be part as well part of this, this workshop throughout the days, although they'll be getting up and running around and um, making sure on the night that we have tamales and tequila that there's tamales and tequila and <laughs> that the cameras are all going. And so I'll start over here. We've got uh, Bobby and Sarah Sheehan. Right, Sarah is right here. And they are from Working Pictures in from New York City. They're making the Blue Mind movie right now. We've, we've worked with them on a, n a number of occasions, including a, a previous project about this group called Force Blue, uh, which is a special ops group of veterans who are, have aligned to do coral reef conservation and communicate, uh, communicate powerfully about climate change. Uh, and so we worked on that together and kind of fell in love with each other and said, hey, uh, let's, let's make Blue Mind the movie. And so yesterday we launched our Indiegogo campaign for Blue Mind the movie, and it's at bluemind.life if you like to uh, if you'd like to be a, an executive producer alongside Bobby and Sarah, uh, you're welcome to join us or pre-order a DVD. So you'll be hearing more from and seeing Bobby and Sarah throughout. Uh, I guess the only thing I'll, I'll add to that is be careful of the tripods uh, with your toes <laughs> and your jackets and so they don't get just uh, tossed over. All right, and so let's go over here. There's Scott Ramsey who's in from Alaska. You'll notice we've got pretty well North America covered in the room. Uh, Scott is a river guide, and we met at South by Southwest conference and began to work together and collaborate. And I've been working with him as he works on his PhD on the true value of rivers. He's uh, taking a bold and absolutely novel approach to describing what the true value of rivers is. It's not just ecotourism dollars and uh, power uh, creation and biodiversity. It's so much more. Uh, through that blue mind lens and as an expert river gu guide with so many years on the water under his belt he's got a tremendous amount of insight and his research is going to going to change the way we talk about rivers so that's scott uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, lizzie flew in from uh the uk there's lizzie uh, lizzie is a, a absolutely um well some people call her tigger and you'll, you'll figure out why. Uh, I just learned that today. It's her nickname. Um, but she's got boundless energy and is in love with water. But her, her work is helping re people reconnect with their own careers, with themselves. But she doesn't do it in an office. She takes them out to the water. And sometimes they're on the beach. Sometimes it's a beach cleanup. Uh, sometimes it's free diving, body surfing, boogie boarding, uh, water um, hand planing. Uh, there's a long list of, of activities that I've, I've seen her do in her coaching practice and, and always related to being by the water and getting people more connected with their, 
their minds and their bodies, and their, their, their big dreams in, in their careers. So her clients range from uh, filmmakers, uh, BBC filmmakers, to business people, to uh, students, and a wide range of creative types. So uh, Lizzie's in, in from the UK, and she'll be helping facilitate some of our outdoor activities and, and uh, probably also facilitating the tequila, I imagine. Possibly. So, yeah, possibly. <laughs> Um, Rhett is in the, in the booth back there. There's Rhett, in, man in the bubble, in the box there. This is his place. This is Rhett's house. And uh, we're really thrilled to have um, been invited to, to hold this, this conference here. Get, if you get a chance, he's got his whole crew back there, and I, I can't see them all, but meet, meet, the, uh, meet the Wave Street Studios crew and camera people and sound people. Um, this building is actually, everything about it is amazing. From the water, uh, the water catchment that goes into a cistern, to the heated benches outside that you should thoroughly enjoy on these cool days. To ev really everything about this building has been thoughtfully put together. So we're, we're totally honored to be here. And then um, coming around, we've got Alex Kalish, who is uh, my partner in crime from the, from the beginning of this idea. We, we brainstormed with Jason uh, at the Center for the Blue Economy about doing a course, a semester-long course. And through our various iterations and noodlings, um, we decided that it would be better as, to try it out as a workshop. And so uh, Alex and I, and with Jason, have been banging our heads together uh, to, to put this syllabus and curriculum and, and workshop together for the better part of a year. And, and Alex is a, a graduate uh, of Middlebury Institute of International Studies and, and studies uh, Coast, coasts and oceans, and, and a very, very creative man. That's a lot more to say about his uh, creative talents, which reach into art and music as well. And um, really been a pleasure to work, work together so far, and we have big, big plans for more workshops and, and reaching further, further along with, uh, with this effort. Right? So that's our, our core team. Uh, then there's, there's, there will be the, fa the facilitators, uh, the, the people, all of you attending, you are part of the team. That everybody's going to have a chance to, to speak up and share their voice and participate. Um, and then we've got our, our interviewees and experts that will be coming in every day and sharing their wisdom and their insights and their big questions with you uh, as we go along through the, the seven ages of water. So that's our, that's our team. And uh, I want to take a moment also to introduce uh, Morgan, and she gave me a stack of index cards about what I should, should and shouldn't say about it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I've known Morgan for, for quite a while. We worked together uh, doing leadership consulting and facilitation with an organization called Peak Teams, which works around the world with uh, executive leaders. Um, and uh, we always have a lot of fun together. And so when, when Alex and I and Jason pulled, pulled this, t this idea together, I thought, well, I called Morgan and I said, what are you up to? Are you, are you available to help us? We need help. And uh, she's, uh, my wife says Morgan is the most solid human being she has ever met. And uh, that, that means a lot. And so um, you will you, uh, experience that over the next, next few days. And any, anything that, that seems well coordinated, it's because of, of Morgan. <laughs> and anything that seems a little janky and really kind of like randomly fun, that might be us right over here. So, uh, <laughs> Um, that's that's the truth, and so uh, Thank you. Morgan Wiley. Yeah. Thanks. Wow, yeah. I'm going to have you introduce me everywhere <laughs> I go from now on. Like, can you just go before me? Um, so that is our team in the room. A couple other things we wanted to cover with you because I'm sure you're asking, or I've gotten these questions on the phone. Is one, why are there so many cameras, and two, why don't we have an agenda? So number one, the cameras in the room, as Jay explained, the reason we chose this place was because of the access it gave us to a live stream this so that as many people as possible would able, be able to get little bits of this along the way. And secondly, the Blue Mind film, obviously, and you'll be able to see a little snippet of that in our time here today together. But really exciting that this is kind of coming to fruition and in the process of being made. And so that is why all the cameras we will have you sign something that you're okay with the back of your head showing or whatever it may be. If you're not, just come and talk to me um, at some point during this. And then the second thing is the agenda. So 
A lot of people get very uncomfortable when there's no agenda, especially if you're an A plus person like myself that really freaks out when they don't have the details. So to calm your nerves, we do have an agenda and I'm actually gonna have Jay <laughs> help me walk you through it just so you can see what's coming for the next few days. Yeah. And I, I'll, I'll just say, you know, this, this workshop is meant, I just came from a conference in Georgia the past few days, which the, the agenda was everywhere. Everywhere you looked, not only in your pocket and on your phone, it was on the wall everywhere. So you didn't even have a chance to really have any sense that you were late and that there was something you should be going to <laughs> and that you should be in a, in, in a different box than the one you were standing in. Um, that's kind of how we normally do conferences and, and meetings, uh, heavy, heavy on the agenda. And there were screens everywhere, many, many screens. So we're, our goal is to be as close to uh, not agenda free. We have a plan and, it's, and we're going to kind of stick along to it but not to have you always worried about every minute and every, every box that, that you're checking along the way. I want you to be as much in the moment as possible and as few screens as possible. So we'll set the pace. There's no PowerPoint and there'll probably be no PowerPoints. Now some of you, raise your hand if you're disappointed about that, <laughs> right? right. We're, maybe you've, you've had your sufficient amount of PowerPoints for life, your quota. Uh, we're gonna try not to, to add to that very much. Um, if at all. So this little concept. Cool. We do have a flip chart. Yeah, we do uh, have a flip chart. And we've really built each day around that objective model that I talked about of learning, connecting, and sharing. So really infusing that into each of our days together. So we'll briefly walk you through the agenda and then we'll have them up for each day just so you know what it is. But basically we kick off today. <laughs> hey, you're not here's the you're no. like a professional <laughs> Here's the agenda right here yeah, as you right see. No, we're kicking off today. Obviously we're gonna have an opportunity in a second to hear from an expert in the field with Jay up here. We're gonna spend some time connecting and then we'll finish our evening with kind of some light appetizers and drinks out on the patio now that it is not currently raining. Um, tomorrow, Wednesday, every morning, or I should say every morning, including Wednesday and Thursday, you'll have the opportunity to come do yoga in the studio in the morning if you're interested in starting your day in that way at 7.45. Breakfast will be available outside or inside, weather dependent at 8.30, and then we kick off our day at 9.00. And so really, as Jay alluded to, the flow of tomorrow is really birth and water, death and water, play and water, which are three very interesting topics that we're going to weave together. And we finish our afternoon together with a tour at Monterey Bay Aquarium and then some free time to really explore the aquarium on your own through this new Blue Mind lens. And then tomorrow night, we'll have dinner together between 4.30 and 7. You can come kind of at 4.30 for happy hour drinks or get there by 5.30 for dinner. And that's at Hula's, which is walking distance from here. So that's Wednesday. Uh, on Tiki Tuesday. Tiki Tuesday, yeah, <laughs> right. Tiki Tuesday. That's, that, yeah, you can, happy to Not Feel Taco to Tuesday, we're saving there. that till Thursday. Um, yeah. And then on Thursday, we're here again, same place, same kickoff. So 7.45, if you'd like to come do yoga, we'll ask you guys to sign up tonight just so we know how many people will be here the following morning. Obviously, some people might change their mind depending on how late they may be out. But 7.45 yoga, 8.30 breakfast, 9 o'clock kickoff, same exact thing. And then really on that day, on Thursday, we're focusing on the lover and the fighter. So those are kind of the two ages that we're going to be focused on on Thursday with some really interesting um, dialogue in that space. And then we're going to have a water activity, whether it's raining or it's sunshiny, there will be some options for you to sign up for in how to immerse yourself in a new environment with water. And so we'll announce what those are tomorrow and then get you guys to sign up for And us. both those activities and the tour and all the activities that are planned in the tour of the aquarium, we want you to approach those through this new, this new story, this new mindset. Sort of pay attention to how you're, how you're feeling and, and how other people are responding. Uh, pay attention to how the aquarium shifts you emotionally and psychologically and even socially and watch the other people as they are going around. We'll talk more about this, but just to keep in mind that part of the work that we're doing at the workshop is, is that, is to pay attention to things in a different way and take notes, write it down. If you, if you see something uh, that you haven't seen before, or think something you haven't thought before, yep. jot it down. You may, you may be onto something there. And, and so that's our, that's our goal here. 
And then we'll finish um, Thursday night with what Jay has coined talks, tamales, and tequila. Don't worry, you don't have to drink tequila if you There's don't tea. want to. There's also tea. There's tea. There's tea. <laughs> but we have um, three authors plus Jay, so four authors who will be kind of giving talks on their books, um, interview style, explaining, and then doing some book signing, and then obviously drinks, food here. And it is open to the public, so if you have friends that you want to have attend, it'll be here at 6 p.m. on Thursday night. And that, yeah. that is totally optional if you guys feel like you need a night off, but it will be a great night. It's a $10 cover charge at the door to cover the teas, the tea, the tequila, and the smog. For the people that are not part, yeah. not part of the conference, yeah, not part of the workshop. Yeah, not, not for anybody who's And here then already. finally on Friday, we actually move up the coast a little bit to Santa Cruz. So we're going to be in Santa Cruz on Friday. If you'd like to carpool, we'll set that up for Friday morning. But kicking off at the Dream Inn in Santa Cruz, which is great, right on the water. You'll be able to look at the ocean all day. Um, and on that day, we're really covering justice and ebb and flow as the stages. And then we'll end that day really with the neuroscience of awe, which will be pretty awesome. Um, and in the middle of that, you're going to, again, have an opportunity to immerse yourself in water in a completely different way. So we'll have some activities and some varied options for people to kind of spend their afternoon um, out in the environment. And then closing off at the Dream Inn around 530 with some cocktails and appetizers. And so I will say this agenda um, may tweak every 10 or 15 minutes or so, depending on how our conversations go. But really, the purpose of it being designed like this is for you to not sit here and listen to two people stand in front of you for eight hours a day. It's really to have you learn something new, be able to take that and create insight out of it, and then experience it outside in the environment in a different way. And talk to each other about what you're learning and thinking right in the moment, rather yeah. than trying to remember it, to talk about it. Yeah, next week. Yeah, exactly. And so before we kind of bring Dr. Jason Scors up on stage in a second, I'm going to ask you to just have a table conversation and think about what's your intention? What do you really want to get out of this week? You're here for three days and a couple hours. So what's the one thing that you'd really like to take away when you leave the room on Friday? So I'm just going to give you four minutes at your tables to circle up and have a quick conversation. What do you want to walk away with on Friday? Thanks, Yeah. 
So I would love to hear, I would love to hear what you want to walk away with on Friday. So what are some things you chatted about at your tables? Education. Education? Yeah. What specifically? Just learning well, more? That's a common theme between yep. everyone here. Yeah, cool. Education. Okay. What else? I want some new phrases. New phrases? Yeah. Okay. I, I talk to people all day long about the water that are drawn to the water. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sort of bored with my own repartee. So <laughs> communication. New phrases. New cool. Methods. Yeah, insight. Yep. Yeah. Uh, like application, too. Application. Um, how you're going to apply it to every aspect of your life. And yeah. Influence the most, the majority of the people. Yeah, yeah, cool. And I saw a hand over here too. Yeah, we talked a lot about just communicating our own love for water with other people and then communicating yeah. value around water that's not value that's commonly understood, i.e., economic or monetary, yeah. but like that emotional value that we can drive from it. Yeah, too. absolutely. Anything different? Yeah. Connection and networking as well as just growing the network. Yeah. People in the room, people that are coming to speak, people that you meet along the week. Yeah, great. Anything else? I'm yeah. interested in the lexicon, kind of. Um, as a writer, I love to listen to the words people use to describe something that, and particularly this, you know, when we're having a moment of awe, it's outside of words. And the sharing of it is always with words. Yeah. So I love listening to people describe what it is, and, it, and, and we fumble. It's kind of like you look at each other, you look in their eyes like, you get it, yeah, I get it. What are the headlines? You know, yeah. You've done with your book, tremendous. But um, headlines allow people to pass information. It allows us to go deeper than the initial emotional reaction we have toward it. Yeah, yeah, so. absolutely. Okay, great. So I think we have obviously some common themes and probably some different things too. Do we have one more? Yeah. yeah. I was just going to say how water can inspire creativity. How it can inspire creativity. Through different avenues, like art. Yeah. Really yeah, absolutely. So we definitely are going to have the opportunity to see a lot of those things this week and with our time together. And the way that we're going to kind of kick this first session off is really exciting. So we have Dr. Jason Scorse with us from Center for the Blue Economy. Um, and a lot of his students from Middlebury Institute are also here, which is really cool. And we thought a good foundational way to kick this off would be to talk a little bit about our brains on water. So what are some of the things that are really going to foundationalize or that we can start to think about as we step through these stages over the next three days? And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jay and Jason. And so before we dive in, I'm going to give you a kind of a, a little sort of meta setup. Um, with the, these cameras going, there are a couple of really clunky things we have to do, which is something called a slate, where we clap our hands at the same time to mark uh, the audio. And, um, and other things that may involve maybe swapping uh, memory cards and things. So clunky when it happens, but you'll, you'll get used to it as I, as I have. Um, this is the 35th interview we've done for the Blue Mind film. And we've interviewed uh, water people from all over the country and uh, related to, to health care and, and um, uh, racial justice, social justice issues, um, water as therapy, swimming pools, a whole range of topics. So uh, this is our 35th interview. So 
we'll do kind of a little intro and you'll get used to the routine that we will repeat with, with all of our experts and speakers uh, in this format. So I just wanted to give you a little, preempt that a little bit so it doesn't seem as weird maybe initially. So do we have to clap now? Yeah, so it, Bobby <laughs> will, will say something like, um, clap, <laughs> and then we'll clap, and then we're on. So, okay, one, two, three. It's a, like super fun. It is, uh, so um, I'm Jay Nichols, and I'm here with Dr. Jason Scors, who's the, the director of the Center for the Blue Economy at Middlebury Institute for, of International Studies. And it's good to see you. Good to see you. And uh, we are kicking off the, the first ever um, Blue Mind Experience workshop here in Monterey. And I always start out when I interview people with the simple question, which is, what's your water? What's the first water that you you know, can, can remember back to or the first water that you really kind of fell in love with or whatever comes to mind? There's no right or wrong answer. Yeah, yeah. Well, first, I want to congratulate you on, on getting this kicked off and I'm uh, looking forward to this week. I'm going to take this question a little different direction in, in that I think I've always been fascinated by the ecosystems and the, the beings besides humans that live in water and that's really kind of where my mind has gone a lot. I do a lot of water sports and I, I love all kind of aspects of water, but I've really spent a lot of time, I'm not a natural scientist, I'm a social scientist, but just reading a lot of books on the types of consciousness of, of what lives in water and I've spent a lot of time, luckily this last year, with whales and sharks and turtles in their environments and just kind of being amazed at how little we know about this world. I think that, you know, there's some cliches. We know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the canyon right outside Monterey Bay here. And the creatures, we don't even know where great white sharks, you know, how they mate, you know, basics, real yeah. basics about things. So I guess my water is more the fascination with, with the, the, the marine ecosystem. Yeah. That's a great answer and that's, uh I haven't heard that answer before, so not only is it a good answer, it's quite, quite unique and insightful. So you clearly, have, so you use the word fascination. Um, that's, that's an emotional word. Clearly your fascination with water and with the life in the ecosystem, whether it's you know, the sharks or, or the, you know, the interactions in the ocean, that fascination drives you on some level to be the person you are, to do what you do career-wise, and to try to do your best to fix what's broken. And I, and I know you well, and I know you are a warrior, and I know you hit the wall of frustration uh, more often than you'd like, and, but you come back, and you come back, and you come back. And is that fascination part of the fuel of what keeps you going day in and day out? Or, or is there, what else is there to it? What so fuels you? We're going full spiritual, right from, <laughs> no, from no, Jump no, it's, Street it's, here. No, we're going, we're going <laughs> neurochemical. Right, okay, that, and, that, and they're the same thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the two sides of the same coin. Yes, uh, yes, right, and. <laughs> right. Um, wow. You know, I guess the, 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 the true answer here is, for me, you know, this is the one shot we have. This is it. Right. There is, you know, I, I really believe that this is all there is. And what's in the ocean, you know, has evolved for billions of years into these incredibly beautiful, complex systems that we are destroying with a kind of abandon mm -hmm. and with all ignorance that is staggering. And so, you know, if we can't try to stop that, what, you know, why are we here? What, what are we doing? So it's simple. not just fascination, but it sounds like there's a piece of um, fear. Mm -hmm. and, and justice, fear. I'd and say, justice. too. justice, all right. I'd like to get some justice for the ocean. Right, right. So clearly um, an, uh, an emotional approach, but you're, you know, part of what you do as an economist um, is to, to quantify the value of you know, the blue parts of the world, the watery parts of the world, and what's found within the water. And oftentimes the emotional piece is left out of the conversation. So let's go, let's kind of walk through that and, and, and from a, maybe a theoretical and a really practical perspective, um, why is this stuff that clearly we've heard from everybody here today that it's, there's an emotional component to what fuels them, whether it's, it's justice or fear 
or fascination. I even heard the word love uh, from this table over here, and I imagine it came up among every conversation. Yet when we learn about what the ocean gives to us and why it's valuable, those are not the words that are used. There's another set of words related to oxygen and resources mm -hmm. and jobs and grams of protein or you know, kilos of protein. Yeah. Um, so why, why the disconnect? What, where, how do you see that? Yeah, I think, I think the answers are kind of amazingly banal in the sense that I think it's two parts. One is, and I think you and others are doing some work to correct this, but it is difficult to measure. I mean, it is measurable, but it's not easy to measure, right? Yeah. Uh, and to also distinguish it, you know, there's the kind of the nature RX kind of thing where nature mm -hmm. gives us all these, so to, you, know, it, you know, what's different from the feeling, you know, of refresh getting out of a shower or a river or a hot tub versus the ocean and really distilling all these, it's actually quite complicated. Yeah. I think it's doable, but it's complicated. So there's just a measurement issue. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of a cop out, to be honest. Yeah, and I'm gonna, let me push back on that. Okay, please. Because um, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. The uh, you just told me that we don't know anything about the ocean compared to the moon. So white sharks are hard to measure. The canyon in your backyard is hard to measure, mm -hmm. and we know very little about it. Yet it doesn't stop us from focusing almost entirely on ecological and economic justification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, emotion's hard to measure, but. So is that canyon, and it's right there. Yeah. So we use the technology, high-tech stuff, to go down and, and look in that canyon. And maybe we can use high-tech stuff to go and look in this canyon yeah. that's like between yeah. our ears. Absolutely. No, I agree with that, and, and, and obviously that's the direction this stuff needs to go. Yeah. I think the, the second part of the answer is perhaps harder and more disturbing, which is, you know, we're we're embedded in a hyper-capitalistic framework mm -hmm. where all value in the world is really from extraction and exploitation. Mm -hmm. Really just, and we're embedded in that. We're so, it's, you know, taking a metaphor of water, it's like being in the fishbowl and not knowing you're in the fishbowl. Right. That, that's just the language from day one, from probably even before we're even born, right? Our parents are watching, com you know, commercials and TV and ads and, they're embedded in this culture and it's just, you know, like you said, you went through 24 years of not only education, but very good education. Mm -hmm. And you never once had that. That's not, that's not just a random occurrence, right? That's because the culture that we've created just simply doesn't value that. In fact, it's a threat to that, right? I mean, everything we're going to talk about this week is a threat mm -hmm. to the powers that, 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 you know, profit off of exploitation yeah. and extraction. Right. So I'm going to push back on that too, and I and, I'm, Please, and I, I am in agreement. The, uh, so when I was a kid, there is the, there is this kind of tea that spent a lot of money advertising. It's called Nest Tea. Mm -hmm. You've probably heard of it, I right? I remember it. And the way they sold their tea was by showing you video of people falling backwards into water with the biggest smile ever on their face. Commercial. It's called the Nest Tea Plunge. Mm -hmm. And so if there was a period of my life where the only way I ever entered a body of water was doing the nesty plunge. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's that awesome. that was like that was my move, right? I was like, I'm gonna do the nesty plunge, and I fall backwards and smile, right? So we again to this you know this capitalistic culture that we live in. Uh, we sold tea using Blue Mind, mm -hmm. right? There's another brand called Mountain Dew. They sold sugar water by showing you how damn fun it was to go off a rope swing into a mountain lake. And just like, that was their whole ad, was a slow motion Tarzan yell dude just swinging on a rope and then letting go and mm -hmm. falling into the lake. And then the, then the logo came up and said Mountain Dew. Blew mind. Um, and then Corona. Fairly uh, not so good beer in a clear bottle. They built their brand on this, you know, this, these ads that just depict the beauty and the sound of the ocean. Sometimes... The whole ad would be just the sound of the ocean in one shot, mm -hmm. and then the corona ad. And so, to your point, that it, within advertising, some big brands, multi-million dollar brands, with millions of dollars to spend on advertising, used our emotional connection to water and that feel-good thing to sell their product. Yet when we are trying to, quote-unquote, sell protecting the water, 
we go to the most clunky factoid, maybe fear-based uh, and guilt toolbox, and it doesn't really work. So maybe if we took a more nesty approach uh, and added, not, not entirely, but just add that tool to our toolbox, um, it might work. I mean, is that? Yeah, I mean, I think you're really on to something here. Even more broadly, just basic kind of behavior design, behavior modification principles, mm -hmm. the environmental conservation movement hasn't even begun to scratch the surface. So I'm actually doing some classes on this right now because we're 40 years behind. Yeah. So you pointed out very popular multinational brands that have been on this. And you're right, they, they know it and they know how powerful it is and we're just really behind. And why that is, why kind of academia hasn't, maybe almost in a weird way, maybe because they felt that was crass, right? Yeah, to kind of yeah. playing to emotions was kind of the stuff, you know, if you were a scientist, you're supposed to be data right. and hard and rigorous and emotions the kind of cheap way out. That's what the advertisers do to get you to drink soda. So maybe in a, in a weird way, we kind of shot ourselves yeah. in the foot by not realizing that those things are powerful for a reason and they're not cheap, right. that they're actually the most authentic. So yeah. I, I don't have a good answer for yeah. this, but yeah. we're, we're playing catch up. Yeah, and that's, and that's really what this entire conversation is about. And that's why we wanted to, to begin our, our workshop with, um, with you is to kind of identify these, maybe these weak spots and, and try to um, fix them and do a better job. Um, but also, I think more importantly, identify what forces are really in our way uh, without making anything up or without giving more, more credence to uh, the barriers than they deserve, but to identify why, what are the forces that have kept this you know, blue mind conversation out of our, our communication strategy uh, on behalf of, our, uh, of the watery parts of our planet. Yeah. And, and in, order, in order to address them and remove the, those barriers, we need to know what they are, mm -hmm. right? And then we can start to talk about them more clearly. And I think that's part of what we hope to do over these next few days is get at some of that because we've got an incredible uh, diversity of expertise gathered here and, and you know, both from the front of the room but also all of our participants and facilitators. Yeah. So, so let's, let's get at that a little bit. This is sort of where the rubber hits the road. Yeah. How do we... Um, educate the next generation of leaders so that they take this science, take these insights, um, take the new language, the new story that we're developing, and, and put it into practice. How do we get that into not just the grad school classroom, but the first grade classroom? Mm -hmm. So that it isn't uh, true that somebody reaches the 24th grade and says, wow, the only place I heard about this blue mind thing was at an NST commercial right. or in a, in a Corona ad. Uh, no, none of my professors or uh, grade school teachers ever brought it up. So how do we, yeah. how do we begin to fix that? Well, I'm hoping we're going to figure that out <laughs> this week, to be honest. I don't, I don't have a, a fully developed answer to that, but I'll, I'll come at it from a little sideways, which is I think one of the reasons it's gotten the kind of inertia and of status quo bias against this type of thinking also is a in some sense kind of a a leftover kind of of a kind of the patriarchy that that infects kind of modern science and thinking right because the rational analytical is thought of as kind of the male and the strong and the emotional is thought of as kind of the weak and the female and obviously those are wrong constructs but i think even if they're not articulated that way, I think that's true. And, and science and academia has been a very male-dominated field. And in American culture in particular, but maybe even more just Western culture, emotions have been things that we do, we more think of as personal and subjective. And we kind of put those to the side and we, we, we don't elevate them. Yeah. And so I, I do think part of it is coming at it as a kind of... Uh, it's part of it's breaking out of this patriarchal kind of mindset and bringing a little more of the yin and the feminine into, into balance here. Because, by the way, I think the analytical and the objective and the facts are really important. We're not trying to supplant sure. that, but we're trying to bring some, some equilibrium yeah. to, the, to the conversation. In terms of 
more practical things to do, I, I think, the work that, that, that you're doing. And the irony here is about quantifying it. In some sense, we're kind of giving in to that paradigm, right? Sure. The paradigm says, if it's not quantifiable, it's not real. And we say, okay, let's quantify happiness. <laughs> let's quantify health. So we're still kind of in that loop, right? So again, how do we break out of that? I, you know, I, I'm searching for that, mm -hmm. and I don't, I, don't, I don't have a good answer at this yeah. point. And maybe it lies in the, the yes and approach is to say, look, um, you know, Céline Cousteau wrote the, the preface to, to my book, Blue Mind, and she wrestled in, in, in three and a half pages, she wrestles with what you just said and says, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to ruin the magic uh, by uh, talking about serotonin and oxytocin and dopamine and, and neurochemistry. But um, maybe we should. Maybe we should do it, add a tool to our toolbox, not forget the magic and this, the way it feels uh, with every cell in your body when you jump into the ocean, um, but also understand it and just bring that, make that island of knowledge bigger, thereby making the beaches to explore longer. Uh, that's, that's the metaphor I like to use about, yeah. you know, the constant sort of push of, of science. Um, and that's, you know, that's part of it. And she says, uh, my grandfather would have gone there, mm -hmm. so, so, so shall we. Yeah. And that's how she ends the, the preface, which gives me kind of chills to think like, yeah, Jacques would, mm -hmm. uh, he would like this, this day. He would like to be in the room mm -hmm. um, and, and talking about this stuff yeah. and the science. Yeah. Um, but not to let the science just make, uh, as we have, uh, not let the science make the ocean boring. Um, and so, you know, when, one of the things we talk about is here, here's the, the litany that we always use at the beginning of every ocean film or any report uh, or on our websites or any keynote, which is the ocean covers three quarters of the planet, 71% of the planet. It gives us, correct me if I'm wrong, billions of dollars of, of, of food and resources. Trillions. Trillions of dollars, right? <laughs> See? And it gives us billions of jobs. I know that's mm -hmm. not trillions. <laughs> and gives us over half and probably closer to 75% of our oxygen and regulates our, you know, our climate, dictates our weather, protects our coasts in a way, batters our coasts. Um, and that's the litany that we sort of drum out with every, every report. And it kind of makes the conversation dull and boring. It, uh, it would be hard to make it more boring. Uh, and so we, that's, but that's our, that's what we do, an almost knee-jerk um, template reaction in the beginning of every, every documentary keynote. It's just what we say. Uh, and we leave out the list of um, the parts that make life worth living, literally. Uh, the parts that motivate you to push forward every day, uh, the emotional parts. And so that's the fourth E. So we've got the educational, the economic, and the ecological arguments. And, and then we've got the emotional, the fourth E, that is the, the lost E in some ways. But I think it's the fourth E that makes the other three E's uh, move and makes, makes, it, makes this whole thing run. Um, but how do we bring that in is, is, is the conversation that we're, I mean, we're, we don't have the answers. That's kind of why we're here talking about it to figure it out. But I think it begins with talking about it, right? And maybe saying to our students, do not ever, ever give another talk. And I think I've said this at a, a, a reception we had at, at the Center for Blue Economy. Please do not ever give a, another talk or write another report and leave it out. Just don't do it. Even if it's one sentence buried uh, in your concluding paragraph, um, put it in. Because if you're leaving it out, you're saying it doesn't matter. It doesn't exist or that you don't know about it. Uh, none of those things are true. Um, so we should put it in, right? And so that's my little rant. Yeah. But, uh, well, let me, let me just come <laughs> out with something pr a little practical, which is kind of you know, on this, which is I use this example uh, in, in my class about you know, the, there was this Mitsubishi uh, salt mine planned in, um, in Baja, Mexico, and it was in the gray whale nursery and it was you know really threatening there's gonna be all the ship traffic and this ports built to, to really destroy uh, one of the most important gray whale 
nurseries. And the last pristine one. The last pristine one. And it was this big fight. And it was Mitsubishi was the, the company that was doing it. And it, uh, Vicente Fox was the president of Mexico at that point. And they, he was about to approve it. It had gone through multiple kind of court proceedings and all this. It had been years. And NRDC was really leading the, the fight against it. And they, they called him up. And again, I don't have all of this down to the detail, but, you know, so, but it's pretty much what happened is they said, look, let us just take you, you and your family out there. And my students will know this story, you know, because it's a key point is they took them out there and the, this place is famous for that the whales will come on the boat and you can like pet the whales. Mm -hmm. and, and Vicente Fox's little boy was on the boat and comes and pets the whale and has this amazing experience. And the next day Vicente Fox canceled the project. And so uh, another thing is, so there's the Pebble Mine up in Alaska uh, is being, it's the biggest proposed copper mine in the world. It's like a trillion dollars of ore and it's, the, the engineering is so complex, it's never been done. The tailings, ponds, and the ecological catastrophe that could happen on the Bristol Bay area and the kind of the best salmon runs in the world is incalculable. And, and it's so far, you know, when I used to teach this, I would always say there's no way this is going to get stopped, right? We got a trillion dollars and we got a couple thousand indigenous people and some salmon. Like how, this is a David and Goliath times, you know, a hundred. And it has been stopped so far. And I talked to someone at Center for American Progress and he told me, the key thing was is uh, there's some real rich hedge fund billionaire guys up there who have their little fishing lodges. Mm -hmm. And so NRDC and other groups have been working with those guys to have them call up people, right? So this is kind of a cynical and perhaps sad state of affairs of where levers of power are. But where I'm getting at this is if we can get key decision makers mm -hmm. to experience and get those connections with the ocean, that can be that can tip the scales and so i guess a real practical thing is is getting policymakers out into the areas we care about right. getting their kids out getting their yeah. wives out getting their whole families out getting constituencies with power mm -hmm. to care about these things and again i understand that there's something uncomfortable about that we should one you know billionaires shouldn't count more than other people but sadly they do mm -hmm. in this world and then getting policymakers who care about the ocean have this emotional connection in those positions. So I do think there's some strategy, there's some kind of policy strategy that we can leverage because NRDC, you know, they ran this campaign for years and, and failed. Yeah. And then that one trip tipped the scale. So I do think there's that emotional, if we know how to leverage it, we can, we can be strategic with right. it. And in that campaign, they had the economic arguments, mm -hmm. clearly the ecological arguments. And I know because I was studying sea turtles on the ground in that same place at the time, major educational campaigns. So they were nailing the three E's, um, but needed that last, the, the fourth E to kind of, kind of make it happen. Um, here's a, I have a, a little, um, we might have to rewind and do, do the, the great whale story one more time. I believe, I believe it was, I believe Carlos Salinas may have been president when it happened, but I don't know if somebody can Google that. Yeah. Cause if, I thought it was Vicente Fox, but yeah, please. Can, can we can correct we, me can if somebody I'm wrong. Quick, if somebody have their phone and can, can just double check and make sure if it's Vicente Fox, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll keep it in. in uh, yeah, just do like NRDC salt mine, Baja, California, Mexican Mexico. Mexico. Yeah, and look at the, find the year that that was, yeah. that was rejected. And then we'll just do the, redo the this great This is why we story. have you all here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fact checkers. And we all have supercomputers in our pockets. Yeah. Who was president of Mexico when the then Mitsubishi canceled yeah. that? Well, I mean, it puts, I think it rests its head on the boat. Yeah, right. yeah. All right. Okay. All right. I'm glad right. you got corrected on that. Okay. All right. This is, this is part of the filmmaking <laughs> aspect that we'll just make sure we, we loop back and redo this the. This is what editing is for. Redo, redo the Grey Well story. Carlos Salinas. Oh, it was Carlos Salinas. All right. Oof. Okay. And so, wait, so Salinas, J, Salinas J one is uh, Jason Zero. In, interesting. The way, the way I remember that Salinas is, uh, is a reference to, you know, so the word Salinas is refer reference to salt. And so oh, just I, another little layer of, okay. of irony or, or poetry, I guess you could say. So let's, do you want to so, do this off camera or you want to so do just it now? Tell, tell me the, just tell okay. me the Grey Whale story and then we'll keep, okay. you know. You, Sorry, everyone, for the repeat. Yeah, the little context right. and. Is a great okay, story. And, I, and I can correct the, so it's come in the lean boat, on the, the boat, the right? Boat, I can, I can, the boat. Okay. Right. okay, so I use this story a lot with my class about kind of the, the emotional power and how it can affect policy and change, which is 
there was the assault mine being proposed in Baja, Mexico, and it was Mitsubishi, obviously a big multinational, and this was going to disrupt one of the kind of the most uh, pristine and important gray whale sanctuaries in the world, and where they give birth and nurse their whales. And, and NRDC had been waging this campaign against it for years. I remember all these petitions and everything and making all these arguments, and they had essentially come up short, and, and, it, and it was about to be approved. And so um, Salinas was the president of Mexico at that time, and they, they made a last-ditch effort. They said, please, can we invite you and your family uh, to come and see, see the area before you make your final decision? And this place is famous for the whales. They come really close up to the boat, kind of lean up against mm -hmm. the boat, and you can kind of touch them and pet them. There's these kind of whale encounters. So the famous friendly whales. Exactly. Right? And, uh, and, and it, the story goes that Salinas' son, this encounter happened. He had this amazing kind of awe-inspiring moment. And that that they don't know that that was what triggered the the, the opposition. But the next day he he canceled the the, the project and they they the, that victory and it, and it's it's held to this day that that project was never completed. Right. So it's a powerful story that shows that the economic arguments, of course, the ecological arguments, but then the emotional component, uh, even among decision makers, not only decision makers but the public and and people in power as well. So great story. Yep. Yeah. All right. So. We are, we're getting close to the end of our, our time for this interview, and I, I, I like to end conversations with another simple question, which kind of is, what in this context of, of Blue Mind and water and our emotional connection, what's your wildest dream? Mm. Like if you could you know, be, be king of the world mm. and say this is going to happen um, in this context, what would, yeah. what would be your, your, your wildest dream? How, how do you see... Uh, the future. Yeah. So, so I, my wildest dream would be put myself out of a job. I would love for economics to no longer be a salient currency in the world. And what I and for that to happen, what would need to happen is this blue mind consciousness reaching a kind of significant critical mass that we didn't need to convince people on the other ease yeah. that there was a sufficient kind of moral um, awareness and moral kind of evolution in which we knew what to do without having to prove it on the economics. And I'll just use a little story that's side to this is I, I've got, you know, I talked to, I, we started this conversation about my fascination with, with the kind of ocean ecosystems. And one of the creatures I've become very fascinated with is, is, is octop octopuses. And, you know, they are some of the most conscious creatures in the world. They can, you know, morph into, you know, hundreds of subtle colors and camouflage themselves in seconds. It's basically almost like a superhero power. Like octopuses are kind of like superheroes in real life. And they can, you know, you've probably, you can see on YouTube, they've escaped from really incredible um, yeah. aquarium locations. They can open tiny locks ones. and things like that and, sli and slip through tiny outs. Again, they're basically kind of the superheroes yeah. of the sea. And yet we round them up in massive nets and eat them in popcorn, fried calamari. And maybe some of you out here eat that, and I'm not trying to harsh on that right now, or well, maybe I am. But the, the reality is, like, I think when we evolve to some point, that's not what we would do to those creatures. We wouldn't need an economic argument. I wouldn't need to tell you all the list of all the attributes. It, I hope, my wildest dream, if I could wave my magic wand, is that 7 billion-plus humans would have the consciousness that Let's, let's let them thrive. Like, let's not turn them into popcorn, shrimp, calamari rolls to drink with beer. That that's not their role. That's not the way we should operate on the planet. So that's my wildest dream. Sounds so you, you started out by saying put yourself out of a job. Sounds to me like um, it wouldn't put you out of a job. You just have to change the name of the Center for the Blue Economy, perhaps to the, the Center for Blue Mind Studies. Yeah, that okay, be, fair enough. <laughs> right. Fair enough. <laughs> I like right. it. Jason, thank you. Thank you. Very much. A Always a pleasure. Yeah. Right. right. Thanks. Okay. You heard some stories. Um, you heard some stories twice. So I want you to just take a minute at your table. It's kind of a two part conversation question here. We are not going to make you sit through refilming that again. We'll do that after you're out of the room. Um, thank you for that. Uh, so I'm going to ask you quickly to have a conversation, either in pairs or with three people, depending on how many people you have at your table. 
But two-part conversation. First of all, what were your three headlines? So what three headlines stood out to you from this conversation? And secondly, we talked a bit about the emotional impact, right? That we're quick to not talk about the emotional impact in a lot of facets of this. So what could you do differently to bring that to the table? So how do we start to have that conversation more readily with people around the emotional side of this, the emotional side of water? So three headlines, and then how can you bring it to life? I'm going to give you six minutes in pairs or threes at your table. Please go to it. One of them. It's one of them. What? I think we can always do them. So if he does that in the future, we'll just ask the person to stay and film them at the break. If that works, because there's always a break between speakers. Yeah, just, just hopefully that won't happen. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Because it's entertaining. But uh, I think they're going to pick up the correct one after the president. So when they're done with this, because I'm going to do that. Yeah, they're going to do it after they leave the room. We can do it right now. I would just, the DM into the room, like, the audience. The audience. The audience. The only issue is now they've heard this for three times. And no, the only issue is they didn't know they were being part of the film. They came to pay to be like, part of the experience, and so I don't want to make them on the first night sit through it three times. Um, we're gonna, yeah, they looked a little like when they had to hear it the second time. Um, to stay, okay. When they're done with this, after they walk out, we'll have you guys stay yeah. and Bobby wants to do it again yeah. right now, but I said no. Right, when they walk out? No, he it? wants to do it now, but I said right. no. Yeah, they don't need to do it three times. So as soon as they walk out, yeah. then you guys will do yeah. it. You just pop these doors open after they, it'll be like 10 minutes, but. Hey, do you, uh, do you want them to sign up for you? Yep, I have, I have this sign up right here. And then they can sign up. Um, I just need to get Like, um, upbeat? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You like my upbeat dance moves? Yeah. yeah, can you do that <laughs> when you sound like Everybody. Yeah, like full on slayer metal. <laughs> I'm gonna let him out in like five minutes, so I think you're, yeah, either way. Thank you. The campaign stands, Selena's basically the thoughts. The campaign, Selena's the thoughts. So then you got it right, it was both. So if 
but we should do it and say the video canceled it. Got it. Come on, guys. What's up, what's up with the one take wonders? <laughs> yeah, we're all kind of right, but the video canceled it. No, you're going to have everyone at every interview being like, actually. Actually, excuse me. Excuse me. Google, babe. Yeah. Fact check. Fact check. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hey Alex, as soon as I actually say like thanks for a great night, please enjoy up then as soon as like they stand up you can turn on music. Okay. Just to get them like dancing out the door. <laughs> Okay, team, one more minute at your tables. One more minute. Hi, Morgan. Shelly, nice to meet nice you. To meet you. Um, so we have a question for you. Yeah. Three headlines and what else? So we talked a little bit about how the emotion has gotten taken out of it. So how do you kind of introduce that back into the conversation? What's something you can do? And sometimes that comes up in the three headlines because he mentioned it. Yeah, cool. Yeah, Sure.